Welcome everyone. This is Mary Vandenplas, Senior Manager of Research and Operations here at Birchworks. Today our Founder and Managing Director, Linda Birch, will be sharing her predictions for the 2019 Data Science and Analytics hiring market. A few quick logistics items before we dive in. Only the presenters will be speaking, so your microphones are muted. We'll have a short Q&A at the end, and you can submit your questions through the, uh, throughout the talk using the chat function on the left side of your screen. If you experience any technical issues, submit those through the chat box as well. Finally, today's session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. So if you missed part of it or would like to share it with a colleague, you're welcome to do so. And now I'd like to introduce your speaker for today, Linda Birch. Linda is an industry expert in the analytics and data science recruiting space and has dedicated her career to becoming a subject matter expert on quantitative hiring market trends. She's a frequent speaker on career and hiring topics and is also an active member of the American Statistical Association and INFORMS. She often shares her insights on the Birchworks blog. Over the past several years, Linda and Birchworks have been repeatedly mentioned in the press, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, the Chicago Tribune, and Mashable. Just this week, Linda and this webinar were mentioned in Forbes, and she was interviewed by Information Week. So, and keep an eye out for Linda in an upcoming piece in The Economist. Last year we were also honored to be on Forbes' list of America's best recruiting firms. Linda, I'll turn things over to you. Well, thank you, Mary. Um, that was very nice. So, and, and thank you for everyone for joining me today. Now, it's been a number of years where we've seen this craze for all things data, turning things pretty much upside down in so many industries, but also in uh, government and even uh, in our everyday personal lives too. The word disruption is used quite frequently to uh, describe this massive impact that data science and artificial intelligence has had on our world, and I think it's certainly apt. So things are changing at an unbelievable rate, and it's hard to keep up. And while I have no idea what the world of analytics will look like a couple of years from now, at least I think I have some insights on what might be happening in the next year, uh, so I thought I would share them with you. So if you've been following me for the last several years, you already know each year I write a few predictions to share with you, and some, um, I will admit, are pretty obvious. Um, others are less so, and um, i got to say that some are just wild guesses on my part. So I'm a recruiter, um, and during the course of any year, I'm talking to hundreds of hiring managers and quantitative professionals. So it, it's a great vantage point to collect a lot of information on what's going on in the analytics community. So looking into my crystal ball for the year ahead, here are my predictions. Number one, China will aggressively target U.S.-based data science talent. Now, we all know China needs smart people as it pursues its quest to dominate the world in artificial intelligence applications. It's obvious to me they're ramping up their efforts to tap into the U.S. analytics talent market with a vengeance. Companies like WeChat, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent all have tons of data and have been making huge strides over the past few years. Chinese companies are hoping to secure the best and the brightest, and they want to pull from the robust data science and analytics training that the United States universities have to offer. Now, I've been hearing from a good handful of my senior level candidates who have been approached by these Chinese-based organizations, and they're looking for advice from me on um, do I go or do I stay? Also, any quantitative conference that you might attend, you'll see dozens of Chinese firms actively recruiting candidates um, at pretty much all levels. If you're interested in learning more about China's progress, you may want to read Kai Feng Li's most recent book, AI Superpowers, China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order. It talks in depth about the rapid rise of technology development in China um, and, and by the way, he rep repeats a number of times that all of this is taking place in the last five years. And it also highlights the differences in outlook and culture between our two countries and how that 
specifically has contributed to the current landscape we're in right now. It's really quite a fascinating read, but I'll warn you, it might keep you up at night. Number two, GDPR may turn the EU into an AI desert. Now there's a few too many acronyms in that title for me, but, uh, but let's go with it. Um, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, is a law that impacts how data can be collected on individuals in the European Union. But it also regulates how personal data can be ex exported um, out of these countries too. So we already know that this has had a huge impact on global companies. And you probably all remember the um, sandstorm of privacy statements you got in your email several months ago when all of this was happening. We haven't even seen what the full impact of this is going, um, will be. Um, but it seems pretty obvious that since the fuel for artificial intelligence is data and lots of it, anything that restricts access to data is going to hurt AI innovation and potential. With GDPR's uh, very daunting requirements and the fact that there are enormous penalties for noncompliance, um, it's putting a freeze on everything from, uh, let's say, email inboxes to privacy settings. The first actual cases are still uh, making their way through the courts, so it's going to be a little while before we see the full ramifications of this act. I, see, I, I think there's a lot of people that are also waiting and wondering if similar laws are coming here to the United States, so we'll have to see about that. While I still think there will be um, world-class analytics think tanks in, for AI in Europe, um, the use cases certainly in business are going to be diminished, and talent may make the decision to move elsewhere. Okay, so this was my easy one, number three. I predict that in 2019, Python will overtake R and SAS as a tool of choice for analytics professionals. Many of you are probably familiar with our famous, or, or what some people like to say infamous, um, report on SAS versus R versus Python, the flash survey that we do every year. We've been surveying analytics and data um, uh, science experts um, now since 2014, so it's been uh, this year will be our fifth year, and it uh, comes out I think in in uh, June. Um, and since we added Python in 2016, it has climbed from about a 20% share to 33% of the votes. And in fact, um, in our 2018 survey, it was really interesting because it showed for the first time all three tools are battling within a percentage point of one another. Now I think it's clear that Python is on the rise, and I expect uh, that in 2019 we'll see it catapult above R and SAS and take that top spot. An interesting thing to note from our extended analysis was that at every segment we analyzed um, this last year, support for Python has increased. Now, so it's, it's highest among those uh, people that are early in their career. So over on the left side of the chart, um, you can see that in the light green bar. More experienced professionals have historically favored SAS, but you can see over in the right uh, hand um, chart that Python is also gaining there. Now a lot of dedicated SAS users will ask me during the course of the year if they should pick up R. Um, and my advice to them more recently has been just jump, jump directly to Python. Looking closer at the early career cohort, you can see Python, which is uh, that light green line, is uh, really rocketing upward as both SAS and R are declining. Most students are now using Python in school. Um, and I think you know, one thing that is important to know that if you're hiring folks at the early career level, um, they may turn you down simply because you're still using SAS. Number four, legacy firms in California are expanding beyond the Golden State in their quest for quantitative talent. Now we all know that the digital native firms in California and other West Coast states have been setting up shop in other states to compete for talent. 
Amazon search for HQ2 certainly made everybody aware uh, of that and, and, and was probably the most visible of this trend. But if you're in any major metropolitan area, you probably have a Google, a Facebook, or even Uber and LinkedIn office near you. Um, but what's a bit more under the radar is that I've also seen more traditional or legacy firms uh, beginning to adapt the same strategy just without the flashy headlines of the big tech giants. By now, we have all heard the stories of people paying crazy sums of money to live in um, a tiny shared apartment or even within a dorm setting in California. And the idea of ever having enough money to buy a home, that's just not on anyone's radar screen in California. So um, as the data science community on the West Coast matures and uh, people are starting to enter new life stages, many have been looking elsewhere for jobs, and so many companies are looking at places like Austin and Denver, Chicago, Atlanta, Dallas, specifically with the goal of recruiting. Also, recruiting data science talent in, in California, specifically in the Bay Area, is extraordinarily frustrating at times. Um, there are just so many more openings than there are candidates. So there are competing offers, there's counter offers, there's sign ons. It's just nutty. Um, and I suspect that the term ghosting likely was coined in California. The housing problem on the West Coast is hitting the headlines. The New York Times today uh, on their front page highlighted Microsoft's pledge of $500 million to fund construction of affordable housing for non-tech workers. Then there's a contrasting strategy. The state of Vermont and the city of Tulsa are willing to pay workers to come and live in their communities. Crazy, huh? Okay, next, five. Salaries have been flat but will increase this year. So this might be my most popular prediction. In the last couple of years, our data science salary studies have shown that salaries, holding, um, that salaries have been holding pretty steady. But this year, I think that that is going to change. I predict that we'll see a more noticeable increase in salaries this year. Let's review some of the numbers from our 2018 study. Now this chart shows the results of predicted analytics professional salaries. So these are the people that are mostly working um, with structured data. And as you can see, salaries have remained pretty much steady from 2017 to 2018. We've seen companies trying to reward employees through um, uh, sort of non-base um, sort of, uh, non salary kinds of um, perks. So um, it, that might include spot bonuses, and other benefits. Um, many of those benefits involve food. Um, but I think that this year, in order to keep up with comp the competitive market, we're going to see more of a bump uh, in base salaries than we've seen in previous years. So that's really good news for candidates and more of a cautionary message for hiring managers. Now here's the results of a flash survey that we conducted last year. When we asked professionals and data science, analyst professionals and data scientists both, uh, which two factors would most motivate them to change jobs, things like challenging work and career growth are certainly important, but the number one factor is still money. Number six, upskilling internal employees and boot camps are techniques to help address the talent shortage. Companies need quantitative talent to staff up their teams, and many are turning toward training internal people to help close that talent gap. Corporate training programs and analytics are on the rise, and the boot camps, like Metis, for example, are jumping right in. Now, okay, so you guys are probably sick of hearing me say this, but I can't, you know, unfortunately I can't help myself. Um, you must continuously adapt to this swiftly evolving career landscape. And so lifelong learning is the key to keeping your skills up to date and marketable. Now for employers, um, quantitative people, um, as you probably know, are naturally curious typically. So they'll generally embrace learning new skills. 
I know it's expensive and it's time consuming to provide internal training, but not only does it make your team more impactful, it also is a tool to retain your prized staff members. Number seven, the visa battle will continue. One of the consistent demographic attributes we've noticed in our salary reports for the data science uh, cohort is that many candidates need some kind of visa support, and especially at the early career level where our data shows that nearly half the group are foreign born. Now, many of you might not know this, but the premium processing for H-1B transfers um, which typically allows employers to shorten the visa transfer process to just a couple weeks by paying a fee, has been suspended for almost a year now. Now, the hiring process has been significantly disrupted for both employers and for job seekers. Most employers are not willing to wait that long for a candidate to start and because the candidates are having to wait uh, anywhere from three to four months uh, for the processing to be completed, and sometimes even up to six months. Companies are really frustrated this, with this, understandably, and it's extremely disruptive to their hiring goals. Now, one tactic that I've seen some firms use to circumvent this problem is to set up their visa-requiring candidate, candidates in Canada instead while obtaining um, and, and, and that's where they can attain an H-1 and citizenship in a fairly straightforward manner. But hot off the Twitter sphere, if, uh, if I can use that word, um, things may be taking a more positive turn. Stay tuned. Next month is when the action halting premium processing is going to come up for review once again. Uh, and maybe, just maybe, we'll see some relief. Now, I put this deck together last week before this tweet came out. Um, I really, really hope my visa battle prediction will not be correct. Number eight, your grandparents will know how to pronounce Huawei. All right, so last year I predicted that even your grandparents will be buzzing about artificial intelligence. And this year, I think that Chinese tech firms are going to be a common topic of discussion across all generations. As I covered in my very first prediction, the accelerating growth of the Chinese tech giants over the last three years has been nothing short of astounding. And because data scientists and AI um, needs data, these firms have lots and lots of it, and their impact will be swift but not necessarily always good. Now, this will certainly have an impact on our ability to retain talent in the U.S., as I mentioned earlier, but it will also have a significant impact on things like data security issues, of course, government regulations, and those things are going to impact many of our jobs. And I suspect it's going to force us also, once again, to adapt to a different kind of normal. So let's all stay tuned on this one. So here's the last prediction, and I will say it's a pretty bold statement. Number nine, the master's degree in analytics degree will overtake the traditional MBA. Now, I am bracing myself for the reaction I'm going to get from my friends at the business schools. I, um, I, am, I live in Evanston, and we're, so I'm right in the backyard of uh, Northwestern, and I have a number of friends and uh, neighbors that teach at the Kellogg School. So I'll be hearing from them, them, I suspect. So hear me out on this because I have a few observations to support this. In 2018, 70% of two-year MBA programs reported a decline in their applications. And meanwhile, we're seeing this huge acceleration in the number of programs for data science and analytics degrees. This is a great chart that Michael Rappa from the Institute of Advanced Analytics at North Carolina State University put together. And you can see just how many data science and analytics programs have been developed uh, in the last 10 years. And here you can see the increase in degrees awarded from these programs. 
Now that tiny text there in the uh, left hand bottom corner uh, will tell you that this chart doesn't even include one third of the program since they were all created in the past few years and won't award degrees until 2019. So this is quite an impressive increase. With interest in the traditional MBAs, uh, MBA programs flagging, I think that analytics and data science degrees are ready to take their place at center stage, and that's exactly where I think they should be. There is such a need for these skills, and it's only going to increase as we churn out and collect more and more data. Uh, so you know, I suspect it's going to be some time before the academic institutions can catch up to the demand. So that's my predictions for this year. Time will tell how well I do, and let's hope uh, that in, at least in one case I am wrong. So in conclusion, let me state the obvious. The mar market is changing really fast, so it's really important to be able to change with it. Also, um, just let me take one minute here and thank all of you for all your support and kind words and friendships over all of these years. I have to say that I've really been honored to be able to work with you in this supercharged and really quickly evolving discipline. So let's definitely stay in touch. Let me know if you need help with your recruiting or to do any brainstorming on your own personal career strategy. Okay, I'm going to hand things back to Mary who has a couple more announcements before we get to the question and answer. Mary? Thanks, Linda. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with us here at Birchworks, uh, we are an executive recruiting firm specializing in quantitative fields like analytics, data science, and marketing research. And we're the leading resource for quantitative talent and jobs. Uh, already this year we're breaking company records for new opportunities available, so if you're on the job market, it's a good time to get in touch. We're also known for our insights about the hiring market and produce comprehensive salary reports for our main specialty areas, which can be downloaded for free at birchworks.com slash study. If you're looking to add to your data science and analytics staff, please let us know. We'd be happy to speak with you and do some brainstorming. We offer contingency and retained services from entry-level analytics all the way up to chief analytics officer searches. Just email us at info at birchworks.com to learn more. And if you're looking to browse for new opportunities, you can check out our targeted job board, which is trafficked by thousands of quantitative professionals in a variety of fields. For more hiring market insights, check out our blog, birchworks.com slash blog, where you can find flash survey results, information on evaluating offers, resumes, interviews, developing trends in analytics and data science, and much more. You can also follow Birchworks across our social media channels to stay up to date on our latest research. Uh, at youtube.com slash birchworks, you can find recordings of our other presentations including SAS R Python data analysis from an actual data scientist, our career series with executive leadership coach Tim Resmeyer, and recap videos of our salary studies. And up next in our webinar schedule is a career planning session with two of our data science and analytics recruiters, Flora Zhang and Stefan Valentine. This information-packed event will include insights on what companies look for, interview preparation, common mistakes, salary and hiring trends, a live Q&A, and much more. So if you have questions about quantitative job search process, make sure you register. And now back to our regularly scheduled programming, the Q&A. So let's jump in and feel free to continue sending your questions in using the chat box on your screen. Uh, so first up, Linda, our first question we have is, uh, what are some emerging areas and industries that you're keeping an eye on? Yeah, thanks Mary. That's, that's a great question and it's one that I get uh, frequently. Uh, and what's interesting is it just seems like every year um, the, the, the list that I highlight is a little bit different. So um, you know, generally speaking, I have to say that all areas are certainly growing, but there's been a few that kind of stick out uh, over this last year and, and kind of more recently too. You know, healthcare is one of those. Um, you know, it's certainly a challenging area, but it's very, very important. Um, energy is another that I'm hearing a lot about, utilities, oil, gas, renewables. Um, also, you know, 
interestingly enough, we started working with a number of private equity firms, either to staff their internal organization um, or to work on some of their portfolio companies, and that's been been really really fun. So, um, but you know, it's it's wide ranging. Uh, for example, I'm talking to a consulting firm this afternoon, um, looking for a head of their analytics. Um, capability that supports not-for-profit organizations. Um, but I have to say, you know, it's been um, – the, the year has gotten off to a, uh, a, an amazing start. Um, in about three days last week, we got 20 new job orders in. It was, it was um, pretty astounding. So. All right. Thanks, Linda. Um, next question we have. Um, You've got someone saying they're excited at the prospect of salary increases this year, and what can I do to make sure that I'm getting the most that I can? Okay. Um, all right. Well, let me just say something right up front here. I am one that I don't believe that raises should be automatic every year. I mean, I think that um, the advice I would give people is that you n need to know how to show your value. Uh, the more um, that you can quantitatively support what you're able to contribute to the organization or what you have contributed during the course of the year, uh, the better. Um, you know, you, ha you should also always have an open dialogue with your boss and, uh, and, and you know, be, be straightforward and but positive too um, because it's kind of a tricky conversation. But, uh, but I think it's really important to keep those uh, lines of communication uh, open. Um, also, I guess I have to add it doesn't hurt to take my salary study in with you when you talk to your boss. But, uh, and I've actually heard from senior level uh, people that uh, I know that they've done that exact thing. So good luck. All right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> great advice. Um, I'm, next, we've actually gotten a couple questions around um, remote job opportunities and any advice you have to professionals in remote jobs um, about keeping their skills sharp or if there's any um, specific tools that those professionals need to make sure they're on top of. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, um, and as I mentioned during the webinar, um, I, I think many, many companies have kind of moved away from the idea of having remote workers. And, um, you know, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, ability to, to quickly communicate what's going on because of um, how fast everything is moving and changing. But if you are a remote worker, though, I would, I would uh, again, you know, there's so many resources now to stay involved. Uh, and understand um, how your industry is changing. And so definitely take advantage of all of that. I would also make sure too that you um, um, get that visibility in your organization as much as you possibly can. I mean, don't um, you want to be known within the organization uh, even though you're primarily working remotely. I would definitely make sure that you're uh, present um, as much as you can be. All right. I think we're going to squeeze in one more question here. Um, and this is about um, the, the rise of kind of specialization. Um, are there any specializations within analytics and data science that you see growing in demand? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, there's just so many new things, and so you have to really make sure you keep your eye out open. Um, you know, one thing that comes kind of quickly to mind is uh, blockchain applications. And that was one of the things that uh, my colleague Heidi Kalish spoke about in, a, um, in their predictions for the financial services industry. But I think it's going to uh, certainly go even broader than that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I could have to think about that a little bit more. But, um, but there's so many emerging areas within the technology. Um, uh, that I think are really important for people to, to keep an eye on. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, today, Linda, for presenting. And thank you, of course, to everyone who submitted questions and for all of you for joining us today. Um, if you'd like to discuss your hiring plans or see if we have roles that are a fit for your experience, please reach out to us. Uh, our email is info at birchworks.com, and we can start the process. Uh, thank you all for coming and have a great rest of your day.